Hello, I'm Mohamed Chanara. In today's video, we will be reviewing pertinent radiological anatomy relating to the orbits. This is a frontal orbital radiograph. I've overlapped and annotated the left side of this image to help give you an idea of the bones that contribute towards the bony orbit. A significant component of the orbital roof is supplied by the frontal bone. You can see it shaded in red here. The crisscross annotation is just to allow you to see some of the bone behind it, but the colour contributes towards the rest of the bone. The lateral orbital wall receives a large amount of its bony covering from the zygomatic bone, which has its typical elephant trunk's appearance as it heads laterally. The sphenoid wing also contributes to the lateral orbital wall, and it's here, shaded in blue. The orbital floor is predominantly composed of bony supply from the zygomatic bone and the maxillary bone, indicated here. The medial orbital wall is supplied by the ethmoid bone here, and its specific component is often referred to as the lamina papyracea, separating the medial component of the orbit from the adjacent closely related ethmoid sinuses, here. This is the lacrimal bone. And although this doesn't directly contribute towards the bony orbit, I've shaded here the nasal bone, so you can see it for reference. Here is the upper dental arcade, closely related to the alveolar aspect of the maxillary bone. This is a coronal bone-enhanced CT slice with the patient looking at the screen towards you. Perhaps the most important thing to notice immediately is that there is gas within the left orbit and around the orbit within the periorbital soft tissues. This patient suffered trauma and you can see that there is a fracture through the left medial orbital wall. The anatomy of the bony orbit can be reproduced on CT from what I have just shown you on plain foam and remains entirely true. You can see here the frontal bone contributing towards the orbital roof. Here is the frontozygomatico suture and the bit of bone contributing here inferior onwards would be the left zygomatic bone. Here is the medial wall of the orbit contributed by the ethmoid bone. You can see a similar appearance on the opposite side. If we now take a coronal CT slice, but enhance it for visualization of the soft tissues, once again, in the same patient, you can see gas within the orbit secondary to the fracture of the lamina papyracea, the medial component of the orbit. What you can see on the normal side is the centrally located optic nerve, closely related to the extraocular muscles, which help to control movement of the eyeball. They're much better demonstrated on MRI, and so we'll go through these in a couple of slices. Here is a coronal T1 weighted MRI scan. Depending on how you view the videos, we talk about the CSF fluid as giving you an idea as to the sequence. Here, the CSF is of low signal, and so this is a T1 weighted image. Let's highlight some structures. Here's the left optic nerve. You have four main extraocular muscles that are called the rectus muscles. This is the left superior rectus muscle. This is the left lateral rectus muscle. This is the left inferior rectus muscle. And this is the left medial rectus muscle. There is an oblique muscle that you can often see on CT and MR imaging, and that's here. That's the left superior oblique muscle. These are tiny vessels that run along the orbit. A point of clinical relevance here. This is the left orbital floor. When patients get punched in the face, you often fracture the left orbital floor. And sometimes what happens is the left inferior rectus can get trapped within the fracture cleft and that causes inability to move the eyeball. It causes a lot of pain and it's important to let our ophthalmology colleagues know if this is the case. This is a slightly different image to one that we may have shown you or reviewed to date but it's basically a fat saturated image that helps to highlight fluid because it's a T2 weighted sequence and fluid is bright. What I'm trying to demonstrate on this slide is that if you look at the optic nerve on the left and the optic nerve on the right, you will see that surrounding the optic nerve itself is a layer of fluid. This is much more striking in appearance when you compare it to the extraocular muscles. 
The reason for this is that the optic nerves are a direct extension of the brain parenchyma during embryological development. And so as they develop along with the eyeball, they drag a bit of neural tissue and meningeal coverings on their route to the orbit. And so this is a little layer of CSF that is surrounding the optic nerves. Let's have a look at the tract of the left optic nerve. Here you can see the left orbit. As we play the video, you will see arising from the posterior aspect of the left orbit is the left optic nerve. Let's follow the left optic nerve as it heads posterior and medial towards the orbital apex. It's just about to traverse the optic canal, and here it is doing so. As it heads intracranially, you can see that the optic nerve on the left forms a union with the optic nerve on the right to form the optic chiasm. Here is the optic chiasm. There's a pituitary infundibulum and the pituitary gland itself. The optic chiasm splits into the left optic tract and right optic tract. These head posteriorly via a number of intermediate structures en route to the visual cortex located in the occipital lobe. Take your time to scroll through these images slowly, perhaps looking at the right side to see if you can trace the structures yourself. Thanks for watching. I trust this was useful for you. Please get in touch if you have any further or specific queries.